Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today to partake in Networking 101. My name is Ann Dwyer. I'm a program manager with McMaster Continuing Education, and it is my pleasure to welcome and to introduce Sean Mullen, student recruiter with CPA Ontario. Sean will be today's uh, facilitator of Networking 101, which I know you're going to find uh, very informative and enlightening and fun. So without further ado, I'm going to, you know, hand things over to Sean in order to conduct the session on networking. Sean? Thank you so much, Anne. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so thrilled to be with you here today. And I want to start off by introducing myself. My name is Sean Mullen. How do you introduce yourself when you meet somebody new? Do you think about it? Do you say your first name? Do you say your full name? I encourage you, when you meet somebody new in a professional context, say your full name. Say it clear, loud, and proud. Because anything less gives people permission at the moment that they meet you, you give them permission to forget you. We're going to hear a lot about today the importance of personal branding and networking as being memorable, as standing out, of leaving a lasting impression. I know it's going to feel weird when you're like, hi, I'm Sean Mullen. Uh, am I taking up too much space? Am I being overconfident? Absolutely not. The people that you meet in your professional life that command that attention and that respect say their full name. You deserve to be in the room. You deserve to be in the conversation and to take up that space. So practice that as you do to say your full name. So I'm a student recruiter at CP Ontario, and I've been in the role for about seven years now. I do lots of soft skill workshops with CP Ontario and another organization that I work with as well. And I go to hundreds of events every year when it comes to networking and meeting new people. And I want to share with you some great insights. Fun fact about me, I lived in China and Korea for five years. So one of the things that we'll talk about today is finding common ground finding shared experiences that we can develop a relationship around. So have you been uh, living in China, Korea? Have you visited there? Have you traveled? Are you passionate about travel? This is an easy thing that you and I can connect about as we start to build our relationship. And I encourage you to connect with me afterwards. All right, I want you to brace yourself. I'm going to show you something shocking. What I'm about to show you strikes fear and terror into the heart of millions of professionals worldwide. Are you ready? The networking event. Oh, oh my gosh, where do I go? Who do I talk to? What do I say? Should I get a hold a glass? How do I enter the conversation? What do I talk about? This is a totally terrifying experience. And yet it is absolutely inevitable. As a professional, there are three things in your life that I can guarantee for you right now, no matter how far you run, no matter how well you hide, these three things are coming for every one of you. Death, taxes, and networking. You're going to have to build relationships, whether you like it or not. And I'm here to tell you exactly how to do it with confidence. Now, I want to start off with a story. I have a confession to make. I'm an anti-networker. I used to hate networking, and it came from this experience I had when I was a little boy. I remember in grade five, we were doing a fundraiser for MS Skipathon. And back in the 80s, your parents didn't care about you going up to a stranger's house. So our job was to go down the street and knock on every door and try and get people to give us a sponsorship amount for me to skip the rope 100 times and it goes to MS. And I remember walking up each driveway with just like butterflies in my stomach. My hands were shaking because I knew that I didn't like having to knock on someone's door, interrupt their day and try to say something the right way and pitch something and solicit enough empathy that they would be willing to help me out. I knew that I wasn't, you know, treating people the way I want to be treated. I knew I had to, to do this right. I had to be fake and put on some sort of act. And that's what I thought networking was. I had to go and meet people that I need something from, that I might need a job or a coffee chat or insider or, or volunteer or some sort of connection. And that I have to be fake and try and say the right thing at the right time to get something. Well, no wonder people hate networking and this is what we're going to learn about today how this is the exact opposite approach and i promise you you're going to walk away from this session feeling really empowered uh, and really excited about building relationships so we're going to quickly talk about networking being about who knows you all the outcomes that are dependent upon people knowing who you are. So how do we get people to know you? We're going to talk some specifics about things you can say or do in conversations. We're going to talk about amplifying your authenticity. People buy the person, not the product. They buy the relationship, not the service. So if we're going to find people that we're going to connect authentically with, that share your vision and, and, and goals and passion and worldview, then you need to be as much of yourself as possible. 
networking is the same skill set you have when you're talking to a neighbor and you're building friends in your own social circles it's the exact same skill set that you're going to apply professionally and if you remember nothing else from the session today good relationship building and good networking is just asking questions that you are interested in and it is a long game networking is not 15 minutes to get a job networking is a 15 minute conversation to start a 30 year relationship it takes time it takes multiple touch points and being yourself along the way and that's what we're going to do now i'd love to know rate yourself how confident are you in networking on a zero to ten scale i'm hoping and confident that at the end of the session you're going to have that number click at least one or if not two more but let's get it out on the table what is it about networking that we don't like I'll go first. I didn't like networking because I thought I had to be fake, that I had to be an actor. And I'm not an actor. I, I don't thrive when I have to pretend to be someone else. That's one thing I don't like about networking. What about you? The more you can tell me, the better I can, I can make sure that I address it during the session today. What don't you like about networking? You know, am I worried that I don't have enough value here, right? Being judged and being biased. What about getting rejected? These are all really viable, uh, really um you know, poignant concerns that you have. And I think that's what we're gonna really work hard to address here today. So like, let's take a break. What is, is networking? Let's start with a common understanding. Networking really is relationship building. Building a network involves finding, connecting with, and nurturing those relationships with people you meet. And for those who have good relationships in their life, and I hope you all do, whether it's with a spouse or a significant other or family or friends or neighbors, good relationships, are about giving. Now, good rela relationships are a two-way street, of course, and, 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 and a good future, fruitful relationship is about giving and receiving, giving and receiving. But if I was to think about, ask you to think about the people in your life who you have the strongest relationships with, they're the people that give you the most. And so if we're talking about networking as building relationships, and we're talking about relationships as giving, this is good news because giving is empowering. And if we approach networking, not like that little boy knocking on the door thinking, what can I take and how do I get it? But instead, what can I offer and what can I give? So much of that fear is gone and so much of that temptation to be inauthentic is gone. And that's what we're going to explore thematically throughout the presentation today. How many of you heard this? Networking is all about who you know. You know, I've heard this my entire career and I thought, okay, so I got to go and know people. I got to go and find and meet people. Well, I want to tell you a quick story about um, a session I do every year at Rotman School of Management. This is the Oise Auditorium. And on the right there is Professor Michael Kong. He teaches Intro to Business. He teaches in this classroom three sections of 300 students each. So 900 students a year. Now, he's been teaching this course for about 15 years now. So as you can imagine, some of the students he taught 15 years ago 14, 13 years ago, are now accomplished, you know, senior business people out in the business world. And every year, some of those senior partners and executives reach back out to Michael and say, hey, Professor Khan, how are you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. Look, we need someone at our company this summer. We need a really strong student intern. Can you recommend somebody? Now, if networking was about who you know, all 900 students know Michael. Would they not get the recommendation? Of course not. Networking isn't who you know. Who gets the recommendation from Michael? Well, it's the people that sit up front. It's the people that put their hand up, that have their name card, that stay after class, that ask questions. Networking is not about who you know. It's about who knows you. It's the students that Michael knows because they showed up, they stood up, they raised their hand. Those same 12 are the ones that got the recommendations. So the question then, if you're measuring your networking and your networking success, the question is, what are you doing to be known? So you may be doing online studies, that's fine, but no one's coming to you. No one's going to come knock on your door. What are you doing? Do you Are you active on LinkedIn? Are you joining associations? Are you connecting with people locally in your neighborhood? If they don't know who you are, nothing's going to be able to happen for you. Real estate agents know this. Their entire career is based on people knowing who they are. Have you ever seen a billboard of a real estate agency without the picture of the agent? Why? Why is the picture so important? Because we have to know who they are, have those feelings of trust and connection. If you're in Hamilton, I mean, everyone knows Michael St. John, everyone knows Golfing Gets It Sold because they know if they're going to be successful and they're going to get people to choose them for business outcomes, they have to be known. And the way they do that successfully is about building connection. And when we're trying to build connection with other humans, the way we stand out is to actually show a little bit of personality without being personal. 
It's okay to, to, to be yourself. It's encouraged to be yourself. Find ways of connecting with people genuinely by being as much of yourself as you can. All right. I have three true or false questions for you. I am more likely to go out of my way to help someone that I know than someone that I don't know. Now, I know you're all good people. I know you would help a stranger. But my question is, are you going to go further, extra, for someone that you know? Another one. I am more likely to go extra, out of my way, to help someone that I like compared to someone that I don't like. True or false? All right, last one. I'm more likely to go out of my way to help someone that I trust versus someone that I don't trust. So all of you are thinking right now, why is he asking us these obvious questions, right? Of course, somebody is more likely to help someone that they know, like, or trust. It's because when we look at it on the other side, from a business outcome standpoint, all things being equal, people prefer to do business with their friends. They prefer to do business with people they know, they like, and they trust. They prefer to give coffee chats. They prefer to give advice to. They prefer to give connections. They prefer to give jobs. They prefer to give references to, to give promotions, special projects, extra help. All of the business outcomes that you will need in your career are much more likely to happen to you if people know you, they like you, and they trust you. If you're going to measure your personal brand, it really is the intersection of these three things, right? If people know you and like you and trust you, you know, we talk about networking sometimes about asking for a job. If you ask someone for a job, you're going to break their trust. It means I'm only in this relationship. I'm only communicating to you because you work at this company and you can help me get a job. I'm using you as a transaction. That's going to break the trust. Believe me, if somebody knows you and they like you and they trust you and they know about a job and a way to help you, they're going to do it. You don't need to ask. So how do we get people to know you? Well, there's no substitute. You got to get involved. You got to come up, come to events. You got to post on LinkedIn, join associations, volunteer, do what a good real estate agent would do and get involved in the community so people can know who you are. Find the spaces in your industry and go to those spaces, contribute, post on LinkedIn so they can know who you are. But how do we get people to like you? It's a very different question. This is Maya Angelou. If you don't know her, she's one of the great authors of our time. She's an American literary treasure, an amazing poet. And she says something really profound that changed the way I approach conversations. What she said was, people are going to forget the things that you say. And they're going to forget the things that you did, but they never forget how you made them feel. Have you been out in the, at the grocery store or at the go station uh, and you see someone you know? And you're like, I know that guy. Oh, what's his name? I get where I know him from, but I remember he's really nice, or I remember he's a jerk. Has that ever happened to you? That's just how our brains work. We're mammals. We process our external environment through the limbic system, the feeling part of our brain. We're able to determine very, very quickly if there's a problem or a threat or whatever, because those who are able to do that are much more quicker at responding and can pass on their genes to the next generation. Marketers know this. Every commercial ad you see understands that your brain is attracted to the feeling. Here's a morning show with Marilyn Jamar. This is a billboard I saw uh, last year. Now, here they are advertising an actual product that you can only listen to on a medium you can only see. How do you sell something that you can listen to on something you can see? You sell the feeling. Look at the feeling here. Oh, we're having a great time. Morning laugh, music goes, woo, right? Your brain loves this stuff. And then the rational part of the brain goes. Coca-Cola, how do you sell something you can only taste on something you can only see? You sell the feeling, right? These are condo ads. Here's a condo at King and Spadina. Now, if you're selling an ad, for a $900,000 condo, wouldn't you show more of the building in it? Why are we looking at these supermodels? Because I want the feeling of being part of the fashion district. Here's what condo in, in Edmonton. No, I haven't been to Edmonton, but I'm pretty sure there's no beach. They're selling you the feeling. That's how brands work. If a brand is going to stand out and get your attention, it's going to make you feel something. And so your brand, when we have a conversation, Oh, I'm not going to remember much of what you said. I'm not going to remember much of what you did, but I will remember how it feels to talk to you. I will remember your vibe. That is a brand. So if we're going to measure networking, the only question that matters when we're going in to talk to somebody, the only question that determines whether that conversation will continue, that relationship will grow, where outcomes will increase, is does it feel good to talk to you? How do we get people to feel good talking to us? Here's a question for you. How much time does it take your brain to judge someone's likability, trustworthy, competence, or aggressiveness? You meet somebody new. How long does it take your brain to judge their likability, trustworthiness, competence, or aggressiveness? Three-fifths of a second, one, one to two seconds, one-half a second, or one-tenth of a second? What do you think?
Well, research out of Princeton tells us that it's actually one-tenth of a second, believe it or not. One-tenth of a second. Now think about it from an evolutionary standpoint. Our ancestors, 10,000 years ago, walk in the forest, the plains and jungles, looking for food, trying not to get eaten. All of a sudden there's a noise in the bushes and boom, something pops out. Our ancestors that in one-tenth of a second or faster can figure out, that's food, get it, or that's a snake, get out of here. The faster they can do that, the more they can survive and pass those genes on to us. One tenth of a second, people have made that decision about you. Now, you've known me for about 20 minutes, so this is not a fair question. But you know my public speaking ability, but you know nothing else about me. You don't know if I'm good at project management, if I'm a good leader, how's my written communication, am I good at sales, how am I with finances, how am I with a, 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 a analysis, with, with data visualization. You know nothing about me. But if I asked you, would you hire me? You have an answer. I hope it's yes, it might be no, but the point is, where does that come from? My cardigan, my beard, my eye contact, my voice, my tone, it's all of those things. It's the feeling, it's the vibe, it's the energy, and that's what you're going to remember, and that's where you need to spend your time focusing, because we go through all of this, I gotta get my elevator pitch down, I gotta say this, I gotta memorize the company's financials, but what people remember is the feeling. That's what stands out. In one-tenth of a second, when I meet you, and when you meet others, you, can judge whether someone is a threat or a reward. Now, I don't mean a threat as in, you know, this person on the left has a knife, watch out. I mean the threat of a transactional conversation. This person is far too nervous. They're so worried about getting a job. They're just talking to me because I work at this company. They're not here to invest in me or give me anything. They're here to take, take, take from me. And we feel that. And that's what I remember. That's what you remember when we talk to these people. And then when we reach out the next time on LinkedIn or some other fur event and I see them again, I know that guy, oh, I'm going to stay away because our brain remembers those threats. In other words, are you a giver or are you a taker? Am I networking? Am I relationship building? Because I just want to take from you and you're someone who I need something from and I'm going to constantly be trying to ask and manipulate and move things around with you and position them so that I can be taking, taking, taking? Or am I in this relationship with you to invest, to go both ways? We feel that inside, deep down when we meet somebody new and that's what we remember and that's what motivates us to build that network together. Okay, you are a McMaster continuing education student or you're thinking about being. So this example, imagine you're a McMaster student or your company name here. Imagine you got this note on LinkedIn. Hey, Hi, Hamo. Hi, Natalie. I see you're a McMaster student. I want to apply next year. Can you help me get in? I need you to tell me what McMaster looks like and looks for a good candidate and how to make my application stand out. Can you put in a recommendation for me to the missions department? I'd also love to have a coffee chat with you so you can look over my application and give me some tips. If you got this message on LinkedIn, how motivated would you be to respond? But what's wrong with this? Does anyone feel irked by this? Does anyone feel that there's something amiss that makes you feel like I wouldn't respond to this? Is this person a giver or a taker? They're using you. They're a taker. They're not reaching out to you. And you think this is unrealistic, Sean, but I get these every day. I'm looking for, hi, Sean. I know nothing about you. I'm looking for a job. Give me a job. Hi, Sean. I'm, I didn't even research your profile to realize you're not that type of recruiter, but I need you, I need you, I need you. They do this all the time. And that's what we think sometimes networking is. I got to give. This is what we're trying to learn today. We need to change our mindset from you're someone I want to meet, not because I want to get in. Do I want a job? Yes, that would be great for sure. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here because I want to get to know you. I want to learn from you. I want to be inspired by you. It's great that you work at Royal Bank. I've always wanted to do that, but I'm here to talk about you and your journey, investing in you, the person. They will feel that difference and you're going to be far more successful. So we're shifting our mindset from what I can get from you to what I can give from you. Then the question is, well, what do I have to give? That's what we're going to explore next. So let's reject this idea of being a go-getter because a go-getter is all about you. A go-getter is a go-taker, a go-user, a go-manipulator. We feel those people. We have them in our lives. I know some of you have friends like mine that can be like that. We don't want to be around those people they suck from us our time and energy and we remember that feeling so instead let's think about being a go-giver let's look at every opportunity we can to meet somebody new to give to pump them up to make them feel special and by investing in them we're going to get all kinds of returns so the goal of networking is to make them feel good how do you make somebody feel good when you're talking to them well one of the first and easiest ways is to say their name as much as you can 
They have hooked up brain scans and done all the languages in the world. And the sweetest word that you will ever hear that makes your brain feel the happiest is your own name. Salespeople are programmed to do this. They know that hearing your name builds trust. They know that hearing your name is going to build connection. It makes you much more likely to make the decisions they want you to make. In this case, you know, let's say... Um, I like to use a used car sales example. So I'm going to use John, for example. Hey, John, welcome to Sean Mullins Used Car Emporium. John, you look like someone who can really spot a deal. Now, John, check this out. I got this amazing Corolla here. It is hot off the lot. You're going to love it. Now, John, get in the car here now. Okay, so John, I want you to imagine you're cruising down the street, cruising the highway, getting 50 miles per gallon. Everyone's like, hey, is that John and that Corolla over there? <laughs> All right, John, come into my office and let's talk financing. Salespeople say your name over and over. Why? They know that it builds trust and connection and that you're much more likely to agree to whatever they propose. Now, I'm not saying this as a sinister trick. I'm not asking you to brainwash or you know use some Jedi mind trick of people you're meeting. I'm saying if you want them to feel connected and trustworthy and to show that you are valuing them, say their name as often as you can. Your smile is your brand. When I'm talking to you like this, how does it feel? How is your energy level? How likely and invested are you into this relationship? Are you feeling my vibe? What happens when I do that? How does that feel? Does that feel different? When you smile, it, it it actually will make other people smile around you. And science says that if you actually fake smiling for about two minutes or so, it'll actually turn into real, to real good positive feelings for you. The most important skill by far in networking is listening. And this is where my, my, my wife would say, you're a massive hypocrite, Sean. But look, only through listening do you have a chance to kind of figure out what the person's needs are. When you're asking them probing questions, do we have common ground that we can build connections on? Then I can ask follow-up questions. Only through listening do you have a chance to then connect with them later on and say, hey, how are your cats doing? How was your trip out west? I showed them that I listened and was invested in them. That's the most important skill in listening. This is the crux of it. Successful networkers, successful relationship builders, successful first daters <laughs> are people that let the other person be the center of attention. Business people want to talk about themselves. They want to tell their story. They want to talk about where they work and why. So let them. Ask them questions and let them be the center of attention. And hopefully by now you're seeing some exceptionally good news. And that is that the most effective form of networking is the easiest. Stop trying to sell yourself. They're not going to remember what you said. Stop trying to sound impressive. They're not going to remember what you said, but they really remember your anxiety as you try to deliver that elevator pitch, even if you landed it perfectly. Focus on them, and then you can be yourself and relax. This is the introvert's secret to networking. It's not about having to say the right stuff. It's about asking good questions that you care about and listening for the answer. Let them be the star. They will feel great doing it. I want to talk about making a first impression. I know it's nervous, right? Demi just explained, I was at PwC, I was nervous, I didn't know what to do. What if I could give you a magic pill that would allow you to increase your confidence by 20% and decrease your stress by 20%? Would you be interested? Let's hear from Amy Cuddy. She'll show you how we can do this. So I wanna start by um, offering you a free, no tech life hack. And all it requires of you is this, that you change your posture for two minutes. I became especially interested in nonverbal expressions of power and dominance. Um, and what are nonverbal expressions of power and dominance? Well, so in the animal kingdom, they are about expanding. So you make yourself big, you stretch out, and humans do the same thing. So they do this both when they, when they have power sort of chronic and also when they're feeling powerful in the moment. So powerful people tend to be, not surprisingly, more assertive and more confident. Physiologically, there also are differences on two key hormones, testosterone, which is the dominance hormone, and cortisol, which is the stress hormone. We decided to uh, bring people into the lab and run a little experiment. And these people adopted for two minutes high power poses or low power poses. And I'm just gonna show you five of the poses, although they took on only two. This is what happens. They come in, they spit into a vial. We, for two minutes, say, you need to do this or this. We then ask them, how powerful do you feel on a series of items? And then we take another saliva sample. Here's what we find on testosterone. From their baseline when they come in, 
high power people experience about a 20% increase, and low power people experience about a 10% decrease. Here's what you get on cortisol. High power people experience about a 25% decrease, and the low power people experience about a 15% increase. So two minutes lead to these hormonal changes that configure your brain to basically be either assertive, confident, and comfortable, or really stress reactive. But the next question, of course, is can power posing for a few minutes really change your life in meaningful ways? And so what matters, I mean, where you want to use this is evaluative situations. We decided that the one that most people could relate to was the job interview. What do you do before you go into a job interview? You do this. Right? You're sitting down, you know, you're looking at your notes, you're hunching up, making yourself small, when really what you should be doing maybe is this, like in the bathroom. Okay, so we bring people into a lab, and they do a couple, they do either high or low power poses again. They go through a very stressful job interview. It's five minutes long. They are being recorded. They're being judged also. We then have these coders look at these tapes, four of them. They're blind to the hypothesis. They're blind to the conditions. They have no idea who's been posing in what pose. They end up looking at these sets of tapes, and they say, oh, we want to hire these people, all the high power posers. We don't want to hire these people. But what's driving it? It's not about the content of the speech. It's about the presence that they're bringing to the speech. The last thing I want to leave you with is this. Tiny tweaks can lead to big changes. Before you go into the next stressful evaluative situation, for two minutes, try doing this in the elevator, in a bathroom stall, at your desk behind closed doors. That's what you want to do. Get, configure your brain to cope the best in that situation. Get your testosterone up, get your cortisol down, and it can significantly change the outcomes of their life. Isn't that interesting that you can con configure your brain just by standing in powerful poses. Now, Amy means power, not in dominance over others, but being more in control, more confident, more assertive. Is that what you need in stressful networking situations at PwC? Absolutely. Our nonverbals govern how we think and feel about ourselves. Our bodies change our minds, our minds change our behavior, and our behavior changes our outcomes. So the next time you're in a stressful situation, whether it's a first date, a class presentation, or... Um, you know, a networking scenario or a job interview, spend that time intentionally making your body bigger. It actually has uh, Harvard-based research behind it. All right, we talked about what we were worried about, right? What do I say? What do I do? Uh, how do I leave the conversation? What about people's bias against me? That's what we're really going to get into to some practical networking stuff right now. Remember, death taxes and networking. It is inevitable. Unless you are a lighthouse keeper as your job, you are going to have to build relationships. And networking is about career growth, right? The purpose is not about asking for a job. It's about building your brand. If I'm meeting you, what is our brand? Remember, do people know, like, and trust me? Every interaction, whether I'm meeting you the first time or Anne, who I'm meeting today for the 72nd time, every interaction is a chance for me to move the needle on those three things. Every interaction is a chance for you to trust me further, like me more, and know me better. That's the purpose of the role. If they like you, know you, and trust you, and they know about a job, they're going to help you. It's not a transaction. The goal of networking is a feeling, and if you're afraid, you're doing it wrong. Let's go into it. Let me ask you, which personality type is best for networking? Yours. Your personality type is the best for networking. Whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, it doesn't matter. You need to be yourself if you're going to attract people to you. So lean into that. You don't need to be fake or be someone else. Be yourself. Your personality is sufficient. People only remember the feeling. Does it feel good to talk to you? Here's the challenge, though. We have this fraud complex. You're in a room and all of a sudden there's Demi, who's a CFO of TD Bank. Oh, my gosh. Demi's here. I'm over at the cookies. I'm talking. <gasps> It's Demi. I have nothing to contribute to this conversation. She's a CFO, for goodness sake. I have nothing of value to offer. I'm a second year business student. I'm going to be a complete waste of her time. Do you know how much money Demi makes in 15 minutes? And she's talking to me. I have no idea what to say. And of course, I'm going to say something stupid. She's going to go back to TD Bank and say, attention all TD employees. Sean Mullen can never work here forever. Right? These are obvious fears that we have. How can even the most confident networker have an organic conversation with Demi? One of the other challenges I have when I go to talk, talk to people is there's this big shadowy monster that scares me. I am so nervous of this monster appearing that it keeps me from talking to you. And the name of the monster is Awkward Silence. Oh, how do we overcome awkward silence? There's a great book that you absolutely need to read called How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it's made by Dale Carnegie. And he says, you're going to win more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years trying to get them interested in you. In other words, if you want to be interesting, be interested. 
Hopefully you're seeing a theme here. Let the other person be the center of attention. You're going to win those friends. I remember being a kid, we would play tag at recess every day and we'd spend 15 minutes of the, of the 20 fighting over who was it. Until finally this kid came along in grade six, Andrew said, guys, let's stop fighting. I'll be it. Let's play. When you're in a conversation, think about how giving is empowering. Think about, about being it. You should be the chaser. Let them be the center of attention and be interested in them. And then you're going to be invited to every game. But the question is, when do I talk about myself? I'm not saying don't talk about yourself. I'm saying that if you go into the session thinking about talking about yourself, you're going to be nervous. They're going to feel that. They'll remember it. But if you go in thinking about giving and connecting, when they ask you about yourself, you're in the most calm state ever. You're already feeling empowered and confident. And then you can deliver your elevator pitch, which talks about what you do, what you're working towards, what's next and why, and what you do outside of business. Here's a good example of that, right? My name is Sean Mullen. I'm a senior business analyst at Company X. I work, have experience in logistics. I'm currently working towards my MBA Chulik. My goal, what's next? I want to grow in my knowledge of data analytics and business intelligence to help Fortune 500 be carbon neutral. I believe in a sustainable future. In my free time, I love when I'm not networking, I play the piano and cooking, right? Here are the themes. I am, I am currently, my goal, I believe when I'm not working. If you want to take a screenshot while I take a drink of water, go ahead. But this is what your elevator pitch should be. Now, your elevator pitch is a whole nother workshop, but I'm just saying that it's okay to talk about yourself, but if you go in with the mindset that you're knocking on that door trying to solicit, you're going to mess up. We're talking about making people feel good. So here is my take on the quickest way to make someone feel very good. Let me start by asking you a question. Think of a time somebody asked you for advice. A coworker, a sibling, a friend, a neighbor, a classmate. When they asked you for advice, what did it feel like? When somebody asks you for advice, these are the typical feelings that you get. Hold that thought for a moment. This is my favorite quote of all time. If you go around asking for a job, you're going to get advice instead. But if you go around asking for advice, sometimes you get a job. The reason for that is when I ask the CFO, Demi, for advice, I'm making her feel that she matters, that her experience matters. I'm letting her know that she has impact on me. There are so many programs around universities where there are thousands of mentors lining up to give advice. Why? They don't get paid. They're very busy because giving advice feels amazing. Old people like me love giving advice. That's why I'm doing this. I'm having a great time giving you advice. If you want to make someone feel good, I can think of no faster, more easier way than to ask for their advice. And you may ask, I'm a first year student. This is a CFO. What do I have to offer? What can I give this person? This is what you have to give. This is the best part of their day. These are huge feelings. And this is why mentors are lining up to give their advice, why people are likely to accept your coffee chat when you ask for advice, because it, they get all of these feelings from you when you're curious and humble enough to go and ask for their advice and insights. Asking for advice also communicates your needs and how they can help you. If I'm asking for advice and figuring out, you know, should I, I'm pursuing the CPA, should I go to work for a firm or in finance, not really sure where I should start my career, you're letting them know that you're looking for your first job. And if they can help you, they are going to. You're not asking a rejectable question. So if we were to pull all of this together, what I would say, these three questions should be in your pocket when you go meet somebody new. These are questions about business that I sometimes ask, and it's really easy. I just ask, I listen, and I think about follow-up questions as best I can. So remember, networking is not about selling yourself, saying impressive things, showing how great you are, and asking for a job. Networking is showing how great they are. It's asking thoughtful questions, asking for advice and insights, and being a go-giver. Now, let's revisit this. And I know I've got two minutes left, and I'll, I'll save time for Q&A, but I'll make sure I'll stick around. So if we're taking this questions approach, well, I have things I can offer. Demi, when I talk to the CFO, I can smile and offer good feelings. I can let them know that I'm interested in her and what she's done in her career and her advice. I can let her have impact on me. I guarantee you, no matter what she did that day, global commodities, trading bonds, yields, the 15 minutes she spent talking to me, getting those feelings was the best 15 minutes of her day. I don't know what to say, but I know what to ask. And you can't reject me. I'm not asking for a job. I just want to get to know you and I want to be inspired by you. 
follow up or be forgotten. Every time you connect with someone, remind them of your common ground, show gratitude. And then on LinkedIn, from now and for the rest of your life, promise me you'll always send a note with LinkedIn. Because you may be at a big networking event and talk to hundreds of people. And, and, and Demi is going to be talking to hundreds of people. They don't know. She doesn't remember you or exactly what you said. But if you can say, Demi, it was great chatting with you at the event last night. Or I, I didn't actually get a chance to talk to you. There were so many people. But I was listening to what you said. You mentioned this great book. Or you mentioned this, this advice that really stood out to me. I'd love to ask you more questions. Always send a note with a LinkedIn request. So how do we defeat awkward silence? Questions. Questions defeat the awkward silence monster. If you can ask questions, so the question then is, because, think about the questions that you like. Think about the questions that make sense to you. Think about the questions that speak to the heart of the person, that pull out feelings and advice. And of course, we need to practice this stuff. You're going to be in an elevator sometime with, with, with Demi and going to go, oh my gosh, you don't have time to be like, just excuse me one second, Demi. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm going to ask questions. You don't have time. It's got to be a reflex. So in your personal life, with your neighbors, with your friends, with your family, practice this. Talk about them for 10 minutes straight and then start to pay attention to how you feel and how they feel. And the more you can do that, the more this becomes muscle memory for you. Wow. How does that look now? Not as scary, right? I know I'm going to come and ask questions, see who I can give things to. I'm going to smile. I'm going to say their name and I'm going to follow up with a LinkedIn note. And if you do all of that, so remember, we talk about network being a feeling. Networking is about giving. It's about being yourself. It's about asking good questions and following up. And if you remember nothing else, be yourself, listen more, power pose. Be yourself, listen more, power pose. If you can be yourself and you can listen more and power pose, then you're not this kid, you're this person. You've got a lot to offer. Be a go-giver. Um, if you are an undergraduate student in Ontario, do connect with me because we have more workshops like this that can help you along your way. Uh, if you're becoming a CPA, of course, you can connect with me about CPA-related stuff, but you can also connect me one-on-one -on, -one on LinkedIn. If you want to know more about this, you want more advice uh, about, about networking or anything, I'm more than happy to connect with you because I love giving advice. It feels good, just like you do. So feel free to reach out anytime. Sean, thank you again. And everyone, thank you for your time today. We hope to see Sean back again in the future. Bye, everyone.